Thank you, President of the inaugural session, Comrade Manik Sarkar. Chairman of the Reception Committee, <coughs> Comrade Pindrai Vijayan. General Convener of the Reception Committee, Comrade Kodiri Balakrishnan. Comrade D. Raja, General Secretary of the CPI. All the members of the Politburo here on the dais. Members of the Central Committee, esteemed guests, delegates, and observers to the 23rd Party Congress. My dear comrades and friends, it gives me a great pleasure to thank you all for accepting our invitation. I am joining this inaugural session of this 23rd Congress of the Communist Party of India, Marxists. We are gratified at the presence of eminent public figures, distinguished veteran leaders of the Communist movement and leaders of various contingents of the people's struggles. I wish to thank Comrade D. Raja for his physical presence here to greet our Congress. Comrades Devartha Bishwas, General Secretary, All India Forward Block. Comrade Manoj Bhattacharya, General Secretary, Revolutionary Socialist Party. Comrade Dipankar Bhattacharya, General Secretary of the CPI ML Liberation. For some compelling reasons, have not been able to physically participate. They have, however, sent their greetings and fraternal messages to the Party Congress, which are being circulated, and they will be read out in the inaugural session. In the present context, the working together of the left parties to strengthen left unity is of vital importance to meet the current challenges being faced by our working people, by the Secular Democratic Republic of India, and the constitutional order. The greetings of the left parties reflect the mutual desire to resolve and strengthen the left unity which is vital in our, for our country today. Comrades and friends, we are meeting at this region of Kannur which has historically been a crucible for civilizational churning and the confluence of many cultures this is also the birthplace of the communist movement in Kerala and one of the outposts of the communist movement in India. Religiously oriented people usually go on Tirthiyatras to visit various shrines to get blessings. A communist or a revolutionary goes on a Tirthiyatra to the places which have been the ground, the earth on which the revolutionary movement advanced and to pay homage like we are here in Kannur because no theatre for a revolutionary would be complete without visiting Kannur, paying homage to the Kayur martyrs, paying homage to the Karivalur martyrs and draw inspiration from the strength of the revolutionary movement and traditions here. <coughs> Pinarai from whose name our Chief Minister, our Politburo member, our leader draws his name, Village, <clears throat> hosted the first Communist Party conference in Kerala. The legends of the Communist movement, Comrade P. Krishnapilla, Comrade A.M.S. Nambadvipad, Comrade A.K. Gopalan, and many others were delegates to this conference. With Comrade P. Krishnapilla as the secretary, the Communist Party started functioning initially from a place called Chirakul in Kannur, braving intense repression, often having to work from underground, particularly when the party was banned. These dedicated comrades carried forward the revolutionary struggles, laying the foundation for the communist movement in Kerala and for the communist movement in that sense contributing to the communist movement in India. The anticipatory vision of the communists their dedicated struggles earned the confidence to make the Kerala Communist Movement a formidable outpost for the Indian Revolutionary Movement. The organizing committee for this con Congress has compiled this rich history, revolutionary history of Kannur in a small booklet called Kannur, the Red Land that is being circulated to all of you and I, I only appeal to all of you to just read it so that we can draw the necessary inspiration for galvanizing the party in today's conditions. 
And in the challenges that we face in today's conditions, it's most appropriate that this 23rd Party Congress is being held here in Kannur, and we are determined to draw the inspiration from this land in order to strengthen the Communist Party and the Communist movement in the country, which is of vital importance. Dear comrades and friends, for more than four years since the last Party Congress, or during these four years, it was exactly in April 2018 that we last met, for more than two of these four years, the world has been plagued, including India, by the COVID pandemic. This has wreaked havoc, disrupting the lives of millions of people. Even before this pandemic struck, the global economy as well as the Indian economy was actually on a very severe downslide, moving towards an economic recession. The pandemic worsened this situation, and during the pandemic, the economic recession that set in was marked by the lust of capitalism for, ca for profit maximization, and it completely exposed the gross inadequacy of capitalism as a system in meeting the requirements of the people, particularly in providing universal health care. In contrast, we saw the experience of the socialist countries, how they dealt with the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, and re-energized their economies to bounce back onto a growth path. This contrast between capitalism and socialism as systems has once again established the superiority of socialism. And the conditions in India at the, at the same time have also demonstrated that where a government led by the CPIM and LDF government in Kerala, the manner in which it had handled the pandemic was, had earned both domestic and international acclaim as the Kerala model, and where you have parties dedicated to the cause of the people, or people-centric, then the handling of the pandemic was seen with a marked difference from what the capitalist countries did. This pincer attack of COVID and the economic recession has led to alarming levels of growth in hunger, poverty, educational deprivation, intensified exploitation of the working people, along with growing unemployment. But at the same time, given the very logic and character of neoliberalism, you find the profits of the world's millionaires rising during the course of the pandemic, that in the year 2020 alone, the total wealth of the world billionaires grew by $10.2 trillion, while the people were suffering from the various issues that I pointed out. And in India, the top 10 people, 10 individuals, during the course of the pandemic, have grown their wealth to hold 57% of our country's wealth, as opposed to the share of the bottom 50% of our people, who actually have a share of only 13% of the wealth. This is predatory capitalism at its worst that, that we are seeing. Now, in this quest, to control the government so that these predatory policies can be followed. The market political rightward shift is taking place in every country. This rightward shift in politics is to ensure governments that will promote neoliberal policies and at the same time disrupt the growing unity of the working people in struggles against this double whammy attack of the pandemic and the economic recession. And this disruption, the political right seeks through emotion, appealing to emotional passions, fostering divisive appeals, promoting racism, xenophobia, religious sectarianism, fundamentalism, parochialism, and in the Indian context, communalism. This rightward shift is to sustain this neoliberal order at the same time to ensure that the unity of the working people in struggles does not reach levels where it can threaten the rule of capital itself. And that has to be prevented. This political rightward shift is the answer of the ruling classes. But this is being resisted. You have countervailing forces that have actually resisted and advanced. And the most classic case, inspiring case, is that in Latin America, where you have 
in many countries, the left democratic and progressive forces, a combination of them, electorally defeating the political right and forming the governments there. As a digression from the written text, I can mention Chile, 50 years ago, when my generation was growing up, was the, was the centerpiece of the launching of neoliberalism with the ouster of the Elandi government and the Pinochet dictatorship that would come in by US imperialism. Now in that Chile, 50 years later, you have a democratically elected, left-oriented government with three members of the Communist Party of Chile holding very, very important positions. Yes, where people have united and fought, this can be resisted, and that has been demonstrated through the Latin American experience and also in some parts of the Europe, where in your Scandinavian countries, you have defeated the political, they have defeated the political right. But in this process, the quest for global hegemony by US imperialism continues to aggravate. In the post-COVID situation, this quest for global hegemony is sought to be directed to ensure that no country or no force can actually challenge US imperialism. And in that, the target, the main target of US imperialism today is China. The rise, the global rise of the socialist uh, China has actually posed this threat whereby US imperialism has shifted gear from this earlier strategy of containment of China to what it today pursuing, the isolation of China. And in the process of isolation of China, it's mobilizing all its, all its allies, all its Western allies. And in this process, it is creating conditions in the world which will have serious ramifications for the social contradictions that exist in the world today at the international level. Now, when this has been going on, came the Ukraine war. Today is the 42nd day of this war in Ukraine. We have said the war must immediately stop. There must be a ceasefire and through negotiations that must be done. But we must realize that this is a war actually between Russia and US and NATO. And Ukraine is the theater where this war is being waged. And this has been caused by the relentless expansion of NATO, which should not have existed after the Soviet Union's disintegration. Expansion of NATO to the Russia's borders, where they have 1,75,000 combat troops stationed on Russia's borders. All Eastern European countries have become NATO members, except Ukraine and Georgia. This effort to make Ukraine a member of the NATO and pose the threat is the provocation for this war. And whatever this provocation, but the war must end, this must be ensured that there's no eastward expansion of NATO any longer. And this must, must be ensured, but at the current moment, the war continues to rage on. But the actual culprit behind this is the quest for global hegemony by US imperialism, which is the reason for NATO's expansion. Now, in this context, while this war has set in many more uh, developments that will have international ramifications, along with the US imperialism's thrust for strengthening its hegemony, in this context, the role of India has come into focus with India consistently abstaining on all anti-Russia resolutions in the United Nations. During the last seven years, particularly, there's been a trend happening earlier, but during these last seven years under this BJP rule, India was taken to a position where its status as a subordinate junior ally of US imperialism was cemented. We've joined imperialist alliances imperialist military uh, arrangements, and with lots of treaties, India became a junior partner of US imperialism. But with the war in Ukraine, the futility of taking up this sort of a direction in India's foreign policy of becoming an appendage to US imperialism, that futility has been thoroughly exposed. It is clear from these developments that India has to pursue 
an independent foreign policy, maintaining the supremacy of its own national interest first and not becoming an appendage to any, any imperialist bloc. And therefore, the time has come for this Modi government to reconsider withdrawing from the Quad, which is a military alliance with USA, Australia and Japan, and with military exercises being conducted, India should start distancing itself from the Quad and should actually <coughs> think in terms of exiting the Quad, because in these conditions of today after the Ukraine war, in these new conditions, this, fut this entire futility of this uh, approach has been proven. While these developments are going on in the international uh, sphere, dear comrades and friends, these four years, particularly since the return of the BJP to form the government in 2019, India has been subjected to the, exec uh, to the aggressive pursuit of the Hindutva agenda of the fascistic RSS. The BJP government is, is adopted a multi-pronged attack in pursuit of this agenda. And the aggressive neoliberal, neoliberal reforms that it is pursuing, which is strengthening the communal corporate nexus that we spoke of in a 22nd Party Congress, which is brazenly promoting crony capitalism with the wholesale loot of our national assets, is legalizing political corruption and simultaneously imposing a full-fledged authoritarianism and authoritarian state apparatus with the complete attack on the democratic rights and civil liberties of individuals that are guaranteed by the constitution. What we therefore see is the undermining of the Indian constitution and change the character of the Indian Republic. All the four fundamental pillars, foundational pillars of the Indian constitution, that is secular democracy, federalism, social justice, and economic sovereignty. Every single of these fundamental pillars is under assault today. The implementation of the fascistic RSS agenda of their Hindutva Rashtra requires a unitary state structure, which is completely contradictory to the federal state structure that is given in our Indian constitution. So to achieve this objective, they are simultaneously undermining, they, that is the government, BJP government, undermining the independence and authority of every single institution created by the Indian constitution beginning from the parliament itself. Laws are made without any discussion whatsoever. The judiciary, the uh, election commission, the uh, CBI, the ED, every one of these independent institutions, their independence is being compromised. And there is a determined uh, attempt also in this process to aggressively carry forward this agenda while not paying any concern whatsoever to the problems that people are facing. There's no question of any relief to all the mishandling of the COVID pandemic by the central government. We have seen the manner in which corpses have floated on rivers like the Ganga. But the concern for people's uh, livelihood their growing unemployment, their hunger, their poverty, none of that has any uh, priority with this government. On the contrary, today I think is the 14th time that the price of petrol has been hiked, petrol and diesel. You have this constant daily rises in the prices leading to a, a, a galloping inflation, which is compounding the miseries of the people. But at the same time, when they are ruining the lives of the majority of our people, pursuing this direction of undermining our constitution and its independent institutions, it has succeeded, which we must recognize, in creating an overarching Hindutva identity in our country, which is the main mainstay, that is the sharpening of communal polarization through the spread of hatred and violence 
polarizing the Indian society. This sharpening of communal polarization is the main stay for their political and electoral mobilization. That reality we must recognize. So therefore, under these circumstances, it is essential that the BJP has to be isolated and defeated in order to strengthen the people's struggles for a better life, to safeguard the secular democratic character of the Indian Republic and the Indian Constitution. Isolating the BJP cannot be achieved only electorally, but it will have to be undertaken by conducting sustained efforts in the political, ideological and cultural social spheres. This 23rd Party Congress will discuss the concrete steps that need to be undertaken to strengthen the struggle against this Hindutva agenda. This, the foremost task before us in this Congress, therefore, is to, be, is to focus on substantially increasing the independent strength of the CPIM and its political intervention capacities. On this basis, to strengthen the unity of the left forces, sharpening class and mass struggles. And on that basis of these struggles, to forge the unity of left and democratic forces on the basis of an alternative program which will be the alternative to the ruling bourgeois landlord classes. And in order to defeat the BJP, to forge the broadest possible front of all secular forces against, the, against Hindutva communalism. These four measures are the direction in which we'll have to, we'll concretize in this uh, Congress deliberations, how we'll proceed on this basis. And therefore, the CPIM appeals to all left secular democratic forces to come together in order to isolate and defeat the BJP. All political parties that proclaim secularism must rise to the occasion to discharge this patriotic duty. The Congress party, along with some other regional parties, must set their houses in order and decide where they stand to safeguard the secular democratic character of the Indian Republic. Prevarications, compromising attitudes towards communalism can only lead, as experience has shown, to an exodus from such parties towards the communal forces. Hindutva communalism can only be combated by championing uncompromising secularism. And that is a, is a point that must be underlined in today's context to strengthen the struggle to meet the challenges that we face. Comrades, we are meeting in Kerala today where the CPIM-led LDF government have shown the way to uncom uncompromisingly uphold secularism, <coughs> respecting equality irrespective of caste, creed or gender, while at the same time seeking to implement pro-people policies as the alternative to the neoliberal agenda. The results are there for all to see, with the world today acclaiming Kerala's high-ranking human development indices. And this achievement has been on the basis of these principles of upholding secularism, respecting equality, and with a pro-people policy alternative. The CPIM shall resolve to strengthen the efforts for building a strong Communist Party, stronger left unity, and forging of a left democratic front. We seek the cooperation of the Indian people and appeal to all Indian patriots to jointly resolve to safeguard our constitutional republic, strengthen the struggles for an alternative pro-people policies, and forging the, for, by forging the broadest front of secular forces against Hindutva communalism. Comrades and friends, we are meeting on a day 32 years ago, we lost one of our veteran communists, one of our Navaratnas, Comrade B.T. Randeve. On this day, 32 years ago, I mean, we recollect his memory, his contributions to the revolutionary cause, and the inspiration continues to remain in order to advance. Along uh, with all the matters that we have remembered today, all the matters of the past that Comrade 
reception committee chairman Pinrai Vijayan's speech referred to, and along with all those who sacrificed to create a better India, we are determined as the CPIM to carry forward this struggle. Finally, comrades, we are very happy and very, uh, uh, we salute, in fact, around, th around 37 fraternal parties internationally so far who have sent their messages, fraternal messages of solidarity to us. We consider this as very important in today's conjecture because as all the developments have shown, there is no answer to the people's problems, to the economic crisis, or to efforts to create a better world under capitalism, particularly under new capitalism with a neoliberal trajectory. The only alternative is socialism, and we are committed that that political alternative of socialism has to be strengthened, and we assure all these parties who have sent us their fraternal greetings that we send back our fraternal solidarity to all of you to strengthen the political alternative in your countries while we shall strive to strengthen it in our country because the future, the one only future that human civilization can ever have is that of socialism and we shall march towards that socialism, strengthening ourselves. So that is the message we want to convey to these parties and I thank you all for coming and joining us in this inaugural session. My red salutes to all of you.